Everyone knows that Chick-fil-A is the anointed chicken. <laughs> Every time there's a district event that includes lunch, it's usually Chick-fil-A. Yeah. I think the desire is to support them because they choose to, to be closed on Sunday. And that one day is for a New Testament believer is not more sacred than another, but the fact to take a Sabbath, to take a day, and to allow their, their workers to have that day off, that's, a, that's an incredible thing. Uh, extravagant generosity. And that is our fourth core value, spirit-led stewards of God's gifts to do His work. And you know what? Generosity is not all about money, but it does include money. And money is a big part because so many of us base our security on the number in the bank account and whether that's black or red. Many of us uh, make our decisions in following Jesus, or rather to what extent we'll follow Jesus, based upon that number. And money is important. Jesus talked a lot about money. There's a lot in the Word of God about money. But it, uh, generosity goes beyond money. And I love that, that illustration we just watched because she, she appreciated the gift, but not just so that she would have the vehicle. It was so that she could bless other people. Amen. Um, there's something that really moves me about somebody who is out looking for a job doesn't have a car and doesn't bring it up, finds a way to get there. I mean, we, we, we honor that sort of dedication, right? Yeah. Amen. And it doesn't mean that she couldn't say something. It don't get me wrong. But the fact that her attitude was so good and that her, her bosses saw this and wanted to do something and got everybody together. I love that she is giving this guy rides and all those things. See, when you let God build extravagant generosity in you, you move from thinking what is enough to what more do I get to do? Right. Extravagant generosity. This is our fourth core value, and it really is kind of the icing on the cake. Because everything else built up to this, and we say... Our, our greatest goal and our greatest aim is to bless others and to bless one another. And we're guided by His Holy Spirit to be good stewards of what He's given to us. You know, God gives us gifts. I mentioned the manifestation gifts that come with this infilling of the Holy Spirit. And not everyone has the same one. We're clear on that. It's, it's as God, you know, decides who gets what. But the idea is that we don't possess gifts we use right. gifts. Yeah. We don't get to claim them. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if you say to me, I have the gift of, I will probably interrupt you and say, you don't have anything. Mm -hmm. You have been used in right. the gift of. And I had semantics, and I, I hope you don't think I'm being mean, but, but it's, a, it's a perspective that's good to keep. Just the same way as you, if you claim all your diseases, I'm going to stop you mid-sentence too. They, you may be afflicted by this, but it's not yours. Stop claiming it. My daughter was here. She'd say, all right, all right. Proverbs 11.25 says, the generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will, will themselves be refreshed. Luke 6.38 says, give and you'll receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. And you're sitting there thinking, here it comes, a stewardship sermon. Here it comes, he wants to build something. Here it comes, the giving must be down. Well, no, a no to all of those things. But I guess we could say, yeah, it is a stewardship sermon. But it's not to tell you what to do. I want to do my best to light a fire that makes you go out and say, how can I be generous? Thank you, Lord, for giving me this privilege of being extravagantly generous. 
I, uh, I'm not going to read it word for word, but there's a, I, this book that I worked on for five years is really close to being out. And uh, it, what do you think would happen is the title. And one of the, chapter seven says, what do you think would happen if the church got a handle on giving? And this comes from just a perspective of 40 years in church ministry, the majority of which was spent on the road going from one church to another, the better part of three decades, and 10 years in pastoral ministry, but, but being able to, to kind of see some of this stuff. And I really, could, I really could tell you some stories, I might. But just, just a couple sentences here out of this chapter. Radical generosity is one thing the world's system can't counterfeit. They don't get it. The world system doesn't get radical generosity, extravagant generosity. They don't understand it because the world system says, what's in it for me? Right. Yeah. E even if you're philanthropic, sometimes there seems to be some underlying, like a control thing, right? Not all, but some. But the system of the world doesn't understand this. Uh, and it, it might even be an annoying source of envy for those who seek to paint Christian leaders as money hungry and self-aggrandizing. And I really hope it irritates them a lot. I hope it irritates people who only see one side of the issue because they should be irritated. There's nothing unholy about talking about money. There's a, there's a principle at work. The money itself is not the object. It's the principle behind what we do with it. And we cannot miss the foundational root principle for fear of talking about money. Um, I, have, I have heard awful offering calls. I have wanted to crawl under a pew sometimes from leadership standing up and, and, and trying to manipulate people. I have given many offering calls and I've always been conscious of it, but you know what? Even, even the idea of giving to need anymore I, I just don't want to do it. I just don't want to do it. Uh, there was a church, one place, and it happened to be an Assembly of God church, just so you know that um, I'll throw stones at our own tribe, who the pastor got up and said, well, it's my wife's birthday today, so we're going to receive a special love offering for my wife. I've heard of churches that have bulletin boards where they will post the names of non-tithers. Yes. And I say, yeah, you have your reward. Uh, I, have, I, have heard, I have heard people give a plea that manipulates people so much that they feel so guilty. And here's the thing. You might squeeze blood out of a turnip if you squeeze hard enough, but the blessing for the giver is gone. And I would say the blessing for the receiver is gone. Um, I've made some mistakes in this area, and I will make some more, I'm sure. Um, when I was on the road in ministry, the last subject you ever wanted to talk when scheduling a service was finances. And... Uh, I would usually use the line. So what is your custom in the area of finances? Because unfortunately, you had to ask. Because I would have people say to me, do you travel by faith? And I said, absolutely. Yours or mine? <laughs> and I cautiously said that statement only a few times. <laughs> absolutely. If you have faith and I have faith, we don't need to talk about it. But there's plenty of places that will do the least they have to. And that's why when we have guests here, we, we don't have that many. And when we do, we want to make sure that we do the best that we can for them. So when we're looking at this subject, I think the best thing we can do is look to the Word of God. And we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 9 this morning, but... Uh, until we get to the point of the scripture, just hold that slide for a while because I just want to tell you a little bit of a story. And by the way, have you ever heard the people, uh, how to say this? You know there are people that are critical about everything the church does? 
they're the ones that probably don't even go to a church and certainly don't give in any way to a church. But they're looking for excuses to stay away. So they'll major on every little thing and twist things out of context. Um, and I know there's nobody like that here. <laughs> Thank God. There might be some watching that will say, um, what did they say? I forgot what I was going to say. What was I going to say? You run this danger when I don't have a lot of notes. Wow. It's that six in front of your... Is that six? Is that six in front of my age? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it'll come to me. See, I got, I got in flesh there talking about people who are critical. I didn't want to get in flesh doing that. That is really something. I'm just going to keep going. So, chapter 8. Oh, I know what it is. Tells a story. Thank you. It is that six in that white hair. Someone will say, we don't need a storyteller. We need a preacher to preach the word. <laughs> Have you ever read the Gospels? Jesus told stories. Yeah. Now, you know there's a lot of scripture in, in what I do because this is our rule of faith and conduct and everything we're built upon. But sometimes a story is a great way to understand what's going on. So, be like Jesus, tell stories, right? So, <laughs> um, I'll do a little bit of storytelling. In chapter 8, Paul is writing to the Corinthians about uh, an offering that he's collecting from many of the churches that's going to go to the believers in Jerusalem. The, the Jerusalem church was under persecution, was uh, experiencing much hardship. So as, as he was writing letters and as he was traveling to different churches, he had told them about this, this uh, offering that he was going to take up. And he just got done telling the Christians in Corinth in this letter that the Macedonian churches, that's northern Greece, different than the Macedonia now by a, a little bit, but still northern Greece, Macedonian churches that were there, about even in their poverty, they couldn't wait to have an opportunity to give. And, and they had extravagant generosity that was not measured by the number, it was measured by the heart attitude. Yeah. And uh, he even, he said here in verses 8 and 9, I'm sorry, verse 9, no, nope. verse 3 and 5. For I can testify, I'll get it right. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more, and they did it of their free will. They begged us. That's the New Living Translation. Good translation. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift of the believers in Jerusalem. Uh, a, little, a little Greek sideline. They begged us, parakletus. It's the, the word paraclete that describes the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And it's translated the, the one who comes alongside to help. The, the churches in Macedonia begged Paul to be that. They begged Paul, let us come alongside. They saw it as a great privilege to do so. No benefit to them, none at all. I, I'm sure they didn't tell, say to Paul, well, we'll do this as long as you tell the church in Corinth what we're doing. No, it wasn't that at all. They wanted the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us just as God wanted them to do. So Paul lets them know that uh, he's going to be sending Titus and another brother to them soon to receive that offering that they have been saving up uh, over a period of time. And uh, he says, look, I, I know you're not going to let me down. Paul writes to the Corinthians and says, I know I don't need to remind you, but I'm going to remind you anyway. <laughs> Sometimes we need some reminders to stay on task, right, to what we've already committed to do. And that brings us to a passage I want to look at today in 2 Corinthians 9, uh, just verses 6 through 8. I mean, I would say, you know, get some time, read this, this whole chapter, 
get a better handle on the context, but I did tell you some stories in advance to give you an idea of the setting of, of what's coming. And Paul is reminding them. I, I know you don't need reminding, but I'm going to remind you anyway. And he goes beyond what the gift will mean to the church in Jerusalem. And he turns it and says, let me tell you now what this gift's going to mean to you. So starting at verse 6, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. Matter of fact, that's on the offering envelopes in there. We don't want you to give by pressure or reluctantly. And God will generously provide all you need, and then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. There's the admonition. There's the encouragement. You know, if this is farm country, so if, if the farmer went out and just planted the seed just enough that, well, if I just do this, maybe I'll get a few ears and, and that'll be okay. Because I don't want to be selfish. You think he was crazy. You talk about in the church, about sowing and reaping, that this is God's design, and all of a sudden, all you're out for is money. See, the pendulum has swung too far the other way. There was a time where the word of faith movement, right, was over here. Name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, anything else you want to call it. And, and it was all about almost, almost like God owes me. Uh, there was a particular preacher on TV that I hear this guy. And he talked about making a vow. Some of you know who it is. Um, some of you do. You've been around long enough. And, and I remember watching that thinking, I'm waiting for the day that you say to make a vow to some other ministry and not you. It, like it was all about like... Here's the rules, the spiritual laws. We're going to make God do something, right? Now the pendulum has swung too far the other way. Now it's like, oh, we can't use those words, sowing and reaping, or, or the word of faith, you know, that's a biblical term. Like, like somehow we can't talk about speaking Jesus. We've got to come back to this biblical solid ground. There is a principle of sowing and reaping, and Paul uses it here. Absolutely talking about money. There can be no question. And he says, hey, if I can paraphrase this a little bit from what he, other things he said, I'm not putting you under condemnation. You do what you want. I mean, that's right in that passage of Scripture. We don't want you to give reluctantly or, or be pressured. No condemnation. Give, don't give. It's up to you. But he says, let me remind you that those who so sparingly reap Sparing. So like he said, I'm just telling you, do what you want. Let God determine how you do this. I'm not going to force you to do anything. Just remember, there's a spiritual principle at work. And if we can understand it with seed, and we can understand it with money, think what happens when you get past the elementary principles of money. Think about what happens when you think about investing your time. Or investing, investing your talents, or investing into somebody else that that needs encouragement. That's where the real multiplication comes. When you invest in people that can then invest in others, that's the multiplication. Money is just worth the very. This is just very basic money. We worry way too much about it. way too much. And, and those of you who can relate to this, that. Maybe over time, you found out that the more you give away, somehow God keeps taking care of you. It doesn't work out on a balance sheet all the time. But decide in your heart how you want to do it, he says. But plant a few seeds, you're not going to get as much. I challenge you to find one person in Shippensburg, who thinks a farmer is greedy for buying more land and planting more seed. 
you will honor that person for taking risk. What about planting seed that's going to produce more than just something for animals or humans to eat, but seed that's going to grow in souls for the kingdom of God? Um, there is a consumer mentality a lot of times in some people that go to church. I alluded to that a little bit earlier. I come to receive. In, it's an over-sacramental view of what we do here. Sacramental is not a bad word. Um, a lot of churches refer to uh, baptism and communion as sacraments. We choose to use the word ordinance because a sacrament implies that an unregenerated person can somehow receive something from God through a sacrament. And we say, no, if, if you don't know Jesus, the sacraments don't mean anything to you. But if you do know Jesus, they, they can be life-giving. So maybe we've erred too much on the side of the ordinance and maybe not given enough room to say there is something about what happens during water baptism, during communion. We don't treat it lightly. But there seems to be this overly sacramental view, and it probably started a, a, a few hundred years after the church was born, when the church started meeting like this in theaters, where they all sat and looked one way. And everybody up front did all the work, and they just sat there. And it became an attitude of, I come to receive. And they, start, they stopped understanding, by and large, that their whole purpose was to give. Their whole purpose was to serve. And it became very consumer. And that's the way it is now. You hear people, well, I went to this church for a while, but I wasn't being fed. Show up at the trough. Amen. Show up. Sorry, that just came out. <laughs> Don't ever say that. There is in this country, you cannot starve for the gospel. Yeah. It is so free, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And they pick and choose. Well, I didn't like the songs they sing. I didn't like this. When are you going to start being a producer? and not being a consumer. That wasn't for anybody here. Unless it was. So when we get into producer mindset, and we realize that in and of ourselves, we can't produce anything. But it's God that gives the increase. And when we understand that there's a sowing, not only of our money, but of ourselves. When, when the, 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 the primary recipient of the crop is not you and me. The primary recipient is somebody else. Uh, I forget who it was that said the church exists for the sake of its non-members. Yeah. And we have to come back to that idea of what the church is for, because that's the New Testament church. That's the book of Acts. It, it did not exist to, great, to, to create big buildings, and, and although there's nothing wrong with buildings, we need buildings. It, it, it doesn't exist just so that we have our favorites, although everyone has favorites. And, and we, we get together in different types of buildings. We get together under different types of labels, you know. And, and I'm okay with that. I've, I've really come a long way on that. It's okay to do things differently. But it cannot end there. This cannot be a preference club. I'll tell you something. The preference clubs are closing. Praise God. I'm not afraid to say it. The preference clubs are closing. And I think if you're not going to preach the gospel, then get out of the way. I'm not going to name churches, but I'm just saying. If all it is is a preference club, then you're not serving a purpose. But the churches that are beyond preference clubs, the churches that are seeking to give of themselves and to dig in and serve him without getting any of the credit, those places, they're thriving all over the world like another great awakening. 
that we are entering into. So, Pastor, are Christians still held to the tithe? Do we have to tithe? Does God still demand 10%? Yes. Yes. Not at all. <laughs> he will gladly accept more. <laughs> the tithe predates the law. Yeah. Yes, right? Yes, the, pride, the, the, the tithe predates Moses and the Ten Commandments yeah. and all of the other laws, 400 other laws. Or 399, whatever it is. <coughs> Abraham gave tithe to Melchizedek. How many people want to name your firstborn Melchizedek? Melchizedek, uh, we read about him in Genesis 37 and also in the book of Hebrews. Uh, we don't know a lot about him except that he was a king and a priest. King of Salem. Anybody know what city Salem is now? Thank you, Jerusalem, before it was called Jerusalem. But he was also a priest of the Most High God. But he does not appear in any of the genealogies of either. He's a mystery. Some people would say that he's a Christophanes, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. But whoever he was, he garnered such respect that Abram gave a tenth of his spoils to Melchizedek. There's nothing in the word that says that this kingly priest demanded anything. But there was this establishment of a tenth, a tithe. That's what tithe means, by the way. And he gave this to uh, Melchizedek. Hebrews 7 says Melchizedek was without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God remains a priest continually. The book of Hebrews is a great book because it affirms what is still applicable from the Old Covenant to the New. Read the book of Hebrews. Uh, I don't know if anybody here grew up uh, in the Jewish faith, but if you didn't, if you read the book of Hebrews, you get a better idea of what the requirements were before and how Jesus fulfilled that. And Hebrews validates Melchizedek. And by validating Melchizedek, Hebrews validates the tithe. So yes, this is something that we are expected to do. I don't think it has to be legalistic. Do you give on the gross or on the net? I think that's your decision. But there's blessing. There's blessing in it. We're not giving to get but the blessing naturally occurs. Melody and I, I'm not quite sure what our percentage is, but we decided that we tithe on the gross. Anything comes into our hand, and God has never let us down. Amen. I'm not asking anyone to do anything that your pastor doesn't already do, but I will not put up a bulletin board, okay? <laughs> Matter of fact, I don't know what anybody gives. I don't want to know. Don't want to know. Um, it's interesting, I'll reinforce this. Nowhere does it say that Melchizedek had a need. It wasn't giving to need. Um, so let's put a face on this. Think about this. Abram willingly gave to Melchizedek. Melchizedek didn't ask him for anything, and Melchizedek did not present any kind of a need, but yet Abram still gave. That's a heart of extravagant generosity. Yeah. Yes. And it's okay to give to a need. It's okay to give to a need. I mean, sometimes it really rallies the truth, doesn't it? Rallies the troops. Something happened. There's been a disaster. Let's come together. And, and it's really exciting to see how people are generous when they're giving to a need. But I, I just, when, it gets supernatural when it gets beyond that, though. When there's not a particular need, there's not a budget deficit, there's not a, it's just, I just want to give everything I can for the cause of Christ, even without a need. Yeah. Truth be told, more people give to success. Mm -hmm. 
than to need. Uh, some more stories. The evangelist comes through town and says, I need new tires on the bus. It's not going to make it much further. And gives an impassioned plea and raises, you know, several thousand dollars to put tires on the bus. Goes to the next town. Gets up and gives the same plea. Hence the term, evangelistically speaking, has come into our vernacular. We don't want to do that. No need to stretch the truth. Our God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We're missional here. We support 23 missionaries every month. Uh, and that, that's growing, right? We want to keep giving. It's good to give. We give to not only missionaries around the world, not only missionaries of the Assemblies of God Strike, but missionaries beyond that, missions beyond that, local missions. And that's good. And it gives us a, a face to put on that need. But if we only give to need, we're missing the blessing. Amen. Extravagant generosity. I'm going to challenge you today that extravagant generosity is more than just giving to need. And I'm going to use a sermon illustration a bit you never thought I'd use. I told you last week it's going to be different. Here, back in January, we had a budget meeting. And we looked at what we've been spending over the last three years. We looked at the categories. We refined our categories. We looked at what had come in consistently. And we started looking and saying, okay, going forward in 2024, what did we spend the last couple of years? Why did we spend this much? How much can we, can we put toward that now? And how can we increase giving in areas that are missional? How can we increase uh, things. Thursday nights, uh, starting in March here, where we're, we're kind of uh, giving a shot of steroids to our midweek Bible study, and we've got classes for all ages, and it's going to be a meal, and, and all of that. Next Sunday, I'm really going to give you a lot of details on that. But uh, it costs money to do that. It costs money to do a lot of things. So we're looking at that. So something struck me, and I don't have the numbers. I wanted to have those in front of me, but I forgot doesn't matter. So you're sitting down there right, figuring out how you're going to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars, right? So I looked at last year, we spent something like $14,000 on furniture. Looked at that and said, $14,000. How did we spend? And we start going back through it. And there's the, the, the incidental stuff that adds up. But we got chairs. The fellowship hall. We got that. And we got really good deals on it. And the people in the church gave toward both of those projects. But we said, well, we don't need to put that much in the budget. We don't need to buy any furniture. We've got a piano. We've got chairs. Get rid of the orange oh, like <laughs> as soon as you contribute a hundred thousand dollars, we'll do it. So, <laughs> so we're, I don't know what we said a lot. It was much less. We won't need it. But something hit me. We did not borrow money to do any of that. But, but listen, it goes further than that. It goes further than that. Here's the real thing that it says. That came from people who gave to a need. We've had people give to a need when we redid the front entrance of the church. We said, here's our plan, here's what it's going to, and they gave to the need. Now I'm going to tell you this. Will you do the same thing with something you can't see with your eyes? Yes. Does it matter that it may not land here where you can see it every week? When it gets beyond the building and gets into ministry, where you're affecting lives, Would you give to the success that God is giving us favor in our community to reach the community? Will you have as much commitment to doing that as you did to buying chairs or new doors or piano? See, here's the challenge. It calls for a deeper level of extravagant generosity. It's one thing to meet a need. It's another thing 
to say, I want to contribute to something that I'm going to get the benefit of seeing or using. It goes much deeper to say, I'm going to give, and I'm not going to put qualifications on this. All I know is it's going to be uh, bringing people to Christ. Amen. And I hope you can trust the leadership here enough to know that we're not going to squander it. That, that kind of extravagant generosity, I don't, it's not for my salary. It's not for the, the, the ongoing things that we do. It's that we can go deeper. And when, when you get to sowing seeds from an extravagant generosity point of view that has nothing to do with the perceived need, when there's no face on it, give to Melchizedek just like you would give to a piano. Give to Melchizedek just like you'd give to New Front Door. Give to Melchizedek just like you would do for landscaping or anything to do with this building or new pews. <laughs> We're giving to, to a, a purpose, a higher calling, a higher purpose. And when you start sowing that kind of seed, look out. Look out. When, when you sow that kind of seed with, I'm not expecting anything back, but I know that I will get it back. Jesus said that None of you who have given up, uh, let's take it into a 2024, none of you who have given up bass boats and RVs and family doesn't agree with things of God, none of you who have given up income, none of you who have given up a promotion will not do so and not receive a hundred times more in this life and in an eternal life. In the, in the age to come. There's a benefit to living extravagantly. <laughs> as long as we don't have that as our focus, let's not be afraid. Let's not be afraid to have a biblical view, a solid biblical expectation that when we sow seed in good soil, that we will see the increase. It's not for us. Personally, it's, it's sowing seed in the kingdom of God.